Good morning, I'm Tom Cato with Race of Truth Fellowship in Raleigh, California, continuing on with our um, Bible study in, in the book of Joshua. We are in the conclusion of Joshua 7. I think we're starting with verse 22, and um, I'm going to pray and recap a little bit about what took place and, and, and then jump into verse 22. So we, we may even start um, chapter 8. Shall we pray? Our loving God and Father, thank you for your mercies, your grace. Thank you for the eye openers that you uh, allow to happen in our lives, uh, not only through daily living, but through your word, your precious word. We pray, Lord, as we continue on in this book that we might know uh, what we're missing in life, Lord. You, you've given us an, an incredible inheritance and, and you want us to take possession of what you've given to us. and and pray that we would learn how to uh, experience using the, the gift, the giftings which you've given to us to use to build up the church, to use to share the gospel with people. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your mercy. We pray that you would open our eyes, allow for the Holy Spirit to not only speak to me, but to speak to those who will be hearing this message. Thank you for your great love for us by sending the Son of your love to go to the cross, to bear our sins in judgment. Thank you that he uh, dwells in us and he wants us to know him intimately and to read his word uh, fervently and daily. So we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we had uh, began the chapter with uh, Joshua's incredible victory, but really through God. They couldn't have done it without God. God was on their side. God said he would fight for you. And so the, the, the victory ended with um, verse 27 in, in, in chapter 6. It says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was all in the land. And then we started chapter 6. In chapter 6, verse 7, or chapter 7, verse 1. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully, in regards to the things under the ban, and then they give the name of the person who acted unfaithfully, Achan. And so this was a, a tragic time. They had, had experienced incredible victory, God-given victory over the spiritual darkness of this world. And um, uh, then there is this turn, this turn in, in a scenery where God withdraws himself because sin in the camp. And sin, uh, just as Adam and Eve sinned, when they sinned, it passed on to everyone. The whole world became sinners at that point in time. We no longer had a relationship with God. We had um, a distance. We may have known about God, but not through the, the God of the Bible. And so uh, sin corrupts us. And it, not, not only us, but it, 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 it corrupts anything else that it comes near them. And so Achan had a family. It corrupted his family. Uh, Joshua was promised a victory against Achan, but because of sin, they, they lost the battle. They turned their tails and they ran away. They, uh, and then uh, not only that, but 36 men lost their lives. And so we go through this process in, in chapter 6 of how God uh, brings the tribes, the families, the households, uh, uh, the individual families of those households, and through the casting of lots, he, he narrows it down to one person, one family, and that's Achan. And Achan means, means trouble, okay? It just, it, it's just, it, in, in, in verse... Uh, 18 of the uh, chapter 6 it says but as for you keep yourselves from the things under the banner there was things that were cursed in 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 uh, Jericho there was things that uh, they we were forbidden to take God said do not take these things except for certain metals gold silver bronze uh, iron Anything that seemed to be able to endure the heat, he said to keep, it was going to be used for the treasury of the, the house of God. And so, so uh, Achan took it upon himself. And you, you may hear his testimony of 
of it, what he saw, and uh, we'll continue on, and I'm going to go through uh, right now. Let's read Joshua chapter 7 and beginning with verse uh, 22. Joshua 7, verse 22, and it starts with, So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath. This is Achan's tent. And they took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and to the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with, with fire, after they had stoned them with stones, and they raised up him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of the place has been called the Valley of Achor, which means trouble. And, and so we're in, in Joshua 20, uh, 22. Um, but the process of doing this took some time because they were casting lots to alleviate. It wasn't the tribe, it wasn't this tribe, it wasn't this tribe. And finally it narrowed it down to one tribe. And all this time, you would think that as this process was going on, that Achan knew that they were gonna be searching for him. But why didn't he ever come forth? Why didn't he ever come and say, I did it? I, I don't know if God would have shown mercy, but this was, this was the breaking of law a law that God gave, he told the people, do not take any of these things from Jericho. Don't take, take them. They're under ban. They were, they were supposed to be burned up in the judgment of God against Jericho. And so uh, people wonder why, why is this, you know, why is God so fierce? Why is he so? It was because these things had been, been used for the purpose of their gods that they, they, uh, celebrated the gods they worshiped. And so God didn't want his people to come in, in contact with any of this because of the uncleanness and the possibility of them turning to their gods. And so, um, and, and later on you find out that that's what happened with, with Israel. But God is the only true God. He's true, he's living, and he wants to uh, uh, have a, a relationship with us. And he's very merciful, he's very gracious but he cannot tolerate, he cannot allow sin because he's holy. I don't know that I can say, understand it, the fullness of it, but I knew there was a time in my life, I knew the Ten Commandments, and I knew that by the time I was in, in a, my, started my college years, my sinning became worse and worse. I got so to a point where I wouldn't even confess sin anymore because they were so, it was just a routine thing. And there were times when I, after sinning and knowing that this was what God said not to do, I feared that he was going to strike me down dead because of, the, uh, because of some of the things I knew about the Old Testament. So there was a fear that I had, not a reverence, not a holy reverence for God until I met Jesus Christ, until I realized that it was the, his son that came in and died for all our sins. So in 22... In verse 22, Joshua sent his messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was concealed within his tent. In Numbers 32, verse 23, Numbers 32, verse 23, it says, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sin will find you out. May we all have the sensitivity to sin in our own lives. First, okay, you know, this, this sin... Uh, we can't hide sin from God. He knows every sinner. He created every one of us. He knows exactly the perfect sinning that they're doing. He knows what's going on in our mind, even if we didn't express it. He knows if we have animosity, hatred. He, he sees it. He knows it. And these are the things that God wants us to become clean and confess. And it's not only confessing, 
but it's also calling upon his name to help us overcome these things. Because God is sincerely a God of, God of love, but he cannot have sin dwelling within us and among us. And so uh, uh, I just wrote this note down. Sometimes God uses our own family members, our own spouses, our own children to, to help us see that we are not walking in the way that God has. <laughs> God uses our family to, to make it clear to us that we're not perfect that we need to go before them. And so they, they confirmed the truth of Achan. They brought everything just as Achan said it was. Going on to verse 24, then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the gold, his sons and daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the Valley of Achor, Valley of Trouble. And this is the, this word is mentioned many times in this passage because Achan's name means trouble. He lived out what his name mean. He brought, uh, he brought, uh, 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 he brought sin into the camp and sin started with him. I, his family knew about it. They knew that he, they knew what God said. This was the message of him, not to take anything of, of Jericho, only gold, silver, uh, bronze, and iron. And that was dedicated for the Lord. All the rest of it was dedicated to total destruction. And so um, in, in verse uh, 21, it says, When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar and 200 shekels, of silver, a bar of gold, gold, 50 shekels in weight. I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my, uh, inside my tent underneath it. And this sounds so much about the repeated sin that took place in Genesis. In Genesis chapter three, verses one through seven, when Adam encounters the, the serpent in the garden, beginning with verse 1 in, in Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Indeed, God has said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said to the certain serpent, From the fruit of the tree of the garden you may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will surely die. The serpent said to the woman, you shall surely not die. God knows in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And when the woman saw it, the tree was good for food, that it was delightful to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband, and he ate. And verse 7 says, And their eyes were open. They were overcome by something they had not experienced from the time that they were created. They saw things in a whole different light. No doubt their emotions were stirred up. They felt a distance from God. They had to hide from God when he came into the garden. They felt... Uh, the guilt of what they did, the shame of what they did. These things they did not have while they walked in the garden. But, but and, I, and I repeat this because these were things, this is sort of what I went through when I was learning the Ten Commandments as, as a child and began to, you know, to steal, uh, began to lie. And these things, I always felt that God was going to strike me down dead. And thank God that he didn't because he's holy and can't, God cannot be in his presence. And so in order for us to have a relationship with him, we have to go before his throne of grace and confess our sin. Why? Because he paid the price at Calvary's cross. None of us should ever want to take for granted that work. He endured suffering uh, equivalent to what we should have 
what we should feel if we never had a personal relationship with him, to be cast into the lake of fire forever, paying for the sins forever, because they, we would not repent. And God works in us. He, he tries to open our eyes throughout the, the years of our living. And some refuse because men love darkness rather than light. And so God, uh, when he opened my eyes, all of a sudden I began to have this sensitivity to sin. As I read his word, I said, I didn't know this was sin. I didn't know this was sin. And I would confess it right there because all we have to do is to go to before the throne of grace and confess that we have uh, sinned against God and ask for forgiveness and ask for power for overcoming sin. And he fills us with his grace and he empowers us to be godly. And it takes time and it takes effort and it takes not taking for granted what happened at the cross. And so their eyes were open. And Jane, for one, we can't ever blame God for, for well, God planted that tree in the garden. James 1, 13 and through 15 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt anyone. He can't tempt him to, to do evil. He himself does not tempt anyone. Verse 14, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, his own craving, his own wanting. Verse 15, then when lust conceives, when love has birth, it gives birth to sin. Okay, that's where sin has happened. We go through little stages in our life in it. And sin, when it is accomplished, it brings forth death. Verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. Verse 20, uh, Numbers 32, again, I, I probably read it before, but it says, but if you will not do so, behold, your sin will find you out. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. And so may we want to have this sensitivity of sin in our, of sin in our life, not for the enjoyment of it, because it can be enjoying, but because this is against God. It, it, it puts a little distance between us if you're a believer, but we were already at a, a distance because in, in Ephesians 1, it says that we were born we were dead in our sins, in our trespasses, okay, dead. We had no feeling towards the presence of God. We became, became, became to lust for the things of this world. And one reason why we shouldn't want to lust for the things of the world is because God says this world is passing away. It's not going to last forever. It's not going to stay this way that we see it today. Um, in verse 23 of Joshua, then took them from inside the tent and brought them to the sons of Israel. They poured them out, out before the Lord. And so here it was. All that he took was laid before the elders, Joshua, the elders, and all the people of Israel. Everyone was a, a, became a witness to this hidden sin. John 3, verse uh, verses 19 through 21. John 3, verses 19 through 21 says, And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Um, Achan's sin was exposed. God brought it to light. It was Achan. But then they saw what they took. Going on in verse 24. Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons and his daughters, his oxen and his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Valley of Achor again means trouble. The mantle was destroyed with fire 
apart from total destruction, okay? Because it was set apart for total destruction. And in Second uh, Peter, verses three, Second uh, Peter chapter three, verses three to seven. Second Peter, chapter three, verses three to seven. Know this first of all that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when, the, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heaven existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Verse six, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. We're talking about the great flood that took place when Noah built the ark and only eight were saved, only eight believed. Noah had preached the gospel for 120 years saying God was gonna destroy the world. And the people laughed and mocked at him then as they are today. And so verse seven, it says, but his word, the present heavens and the earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and a, de a destruction for all ungodly men. Okay, so there is a day that this world was going. And as I look at the, as this picture of Joshua, how they go from place to place, uh, destroying the enemies in that land of Canaan, which God had promised them, and they had to go fight, they had to get rid of the enemy, um, I see equivalents of the days that we live in today. Many of us believe that the Lord Jesus is gonna call his church today, uh, someday soon. And when he does, we're gonna be in heaven with him forever. Our lives will be finished here and we will be in, in heaven forever. But those who, who didn't uh, believe and put their faith in Christ, they're gonna be left behind. And there's gonna be some awful incredible things that happened in this world that have never happened before. And this world will go through seven years of trial, testing, and there will be a still, God still in his love and grace will still have an open door for people to come to know Christ. But the issue is men love darkness rather than light. They're gonna believe a liar and a lie and they're gonna believe in, in the, this man that's gonna come on the scene, which we, we hear and read in the Bible is, is named the Antichrist. And so we have this time, this time of grace that we live in to come to know him as his Lord and Savior. Sin contaminates everything. Romans 8, Romans 8, 19 through 21. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. You see, when sin came into the world, it didn't just affect Adam and Eve and all man, it affected all creation. So the things that we see today are not the way the creation was created. And, and get this, for creation was subject to uselessness or fertility, not willing, but because of him who subjected in hope that creation itself will be set free. will be set free from this judgment. For through the world at that time was destroyed the flood, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Um, uh, the creation will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the Lord and the, and the children of God. So God is gonna restore the earth, but this earth is gonna be destroyed. It's gonna be redone completely. But it's gonna be set up. The lion will lay, lay down with the lamb. Isn't that, what a contrast that is. In Joshua chapter 25, um, he says, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day and all Israel stoned them with stones and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And this is, he's talking about the family. The whole family was under it because it appears to be that they knew they knew that his, their father had brought these things into the house and apparently they were enjoying it just as much as he would. And so they, you know, it was their sin that became their sin as well. 
And Joshua 6, 18 says, but you only keep yourselves from the things of the band so that you will not covet them and take some of the things out of the band. Make the camp accursed and bring trouble on it. And that's exactly what he did. They raised over him, verse 26, they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. Now, when it says this day, this is talking about Joshua uh, as he goes through his life fighting in these battles for war. Finally, he came to a point where he was, uh, his, his work was finished. God was going to call him in, to the grave and, and then to heaven. But, um, but uh, so, so as it is to this day. So I, I don't know, some, I hear in some of these runes are, are still being dug up and found even today. The Lord turned his first fierce anger from the name of that place, which had been called the Valley of Acre. You know, God's anger is only for a moment. I just found a verse in Psalm 30, Psalm 30, verse 5. Uh, his, his favor is, is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. But his anger is only for a moment. You know, especially when we come before the Lord and we, we've said, we, we uh, sinned against him. Uh, his anger is only for a moment. Because the, cross of, because the cross of Christ has made Jesus Christ our advocate. He's our attorney today. He is our living attorney. And he stands before the God when we sin. And he says, Father, this one's mine. I'll take care of him. I'll bring him to, to the point where he is sensitive to that sin and no longer wants to partake in it. We have a great Savior that is more than what, what we can imagine. The Valley of Acre uh, speaks to all of us of the trouble we bring upon ourselves because of our own unjudged sin. This is the issue, unjudged sin. But when we judge sin before God and turn to Him in sincerity of heart, He will make our Valley of Acre become a door of hope and an entrance of blessing. God can change everything in our life. He wants to change us, but we have to get personal with Him. We have to confess we are a sinner. We have to invite him into our life to be the Lord of our life. Lord means master. Lord means I want you to tell me, give me direction in my life from now on. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's awkward because we're used to thinking for ourselves, but eventually as we read God's word, we memorize it, we hide his word in our heart and we have it there available for us at, at our use. At our use, it says, uh, a door of blessing. The Lord is pleading with backslidden Israel in this verse to turn to him. In Hosea 2.15, I will give her her vineyards from there. The valley of Achor is a, is a door of hope. If you repent, he's going to be he's going to be our rock. He's going to be our salvation. He's going to take us through the difficult times in life. We're not promised not to have him. Uh, grace, okay, and in, in closing in this chapter, I wrote down Grace will never set aside God's government, okay? He's still going to judge sin. Galatians 6, 7 says, God is not deceived. He is not mocked. For whatever a man sows in his life, plants in his life, this will he reap. And so we, we have the um, closing of Joshua chapter 8. God has been satisfied. His sin has been judged. And now Israel can go on. Now, uh, I gotta see what time it is. Uh, I, um, I just wanna read maybe two or three verses before I stop in Joshua chapter eight. So I, I will begin there because now everything is set. God's no longer angry. They dealt with it. Now they go back to, to the battle. So in Joshua chapter eight, uh, begin with verse 1, and I think I'll just read up to 4. Now God said to Joshua, Do not fear or be dismayed. Take all the people of war with you. Arise and go. Ai, to see I've given you the land, the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Now God's on their side again. Now he's going to be fighting for them. Verse 2, You shall do just as Ai, its king, just as you did to Jericho, its king, you shall take away its spoil and its cattle and its plunder for themselves. Set an ambush for the city behind it. So Joshua rose up with the people of war, 
to go to Ai, and Joshua clothed, chose 30,000 men, valiant warriors, and sent them out at night. And, and, I'll, and I'll stop right there. Um, now, the Lord had said that to Joshua, do not fear, be dismayed. Um, I may just, just finish up with chapter one because there's some interesting things in it. Do not be dismayed, he says. Take all the people of war with you and arise and go to Ai. You see, I've given the hand of the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. Can we see how allowing sin festers within us and affects our spiritual battles? You, when, when we don't deal with sin constantly, uh, we can't face the Bible. We lose to the enemies, and that's what such a picture we see in, this, in, in the battle of Ai. Ai was a tiny town. There's probably 12,000 people that lived in it. Jericho was huge and, and, and magnificent. And what happened was they had won a, a, a great battle. This walled city, impenetrable uh, wall, was, uh, was um, uh, conquered. Okay, But God's the one that was doing it. Israel had a, a minor part in it. They had to go in. They had to you know, kill the people. They were already fearful. They had to uh, destroy all, the, um, all their properties because God didn't want them. They were, they were set apart for destruction, and only a certain uh, metals were asked. Uh, God had asked that he would use it in his treasury because he's God and he can and do these things. But, but the, um, the issue was this battle of Jericho was, was all God. God did this, okay? And so we can see how festering of sin affects our spiritual battles. Why do you think Joshua, why do you think he said, do not fear or be dismayed? Maybe he was apprehensive and more fearful to go into battle because the impact of Achan's sin on the nation and, and the army. He, had, he, he maybe had a, a part of the time when, when he was, and if he wasn't, the people were apprehensive. Hey, we've already lost a the battle of Achai once. Um, the, the unexpected loss to the Tynal city made insecure feeling of the, of the devastation that they took. They lost the men, they retreated. Uh, this wasn't supposed to happen. They had been arrogant though. They, as though they had won the battle with Jericho. But it was, but it was what the Lord had done to Jericho. They apparently had not given him the glory. They stole from him. How quickly we forget that it is him working in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. You know, and, and that's an issue. Sometimes we, we do great things for the Lord and we, it, we get filled with pride in ourselves when we should quickly say, Lord, this is all you. You give us to open the door.